physics and math sometimes have the reputation of being dull and hard to understand. For many of us, our fondest memories of these classes involve doodling in the margins of our notebook, not paying attention to the tedious calculation that the teacher's doing on the board. But what if I told you that some of the most sophisticated calculations in theoretical physics actually start from little drawings, and that these drawings are becoming useful to understand the materials that define the, the kinds of devices, the, like our most advanced uh, technological devices um, that have been developed in the last century. See, I work in a field called quantum condensed matter, which I admit is not one of the catchiest titles out there. But at a practical level, this is the physics behind every, basically every device that has been developed in the last century. Um, here are some of, here are just a few. Uh, just think about the phone in your pocket and how it is an absolute marvel of science and technology. If you doodled your way through high school physics, you might think it's beyond you to try to understand how these work. But all it boils down to is two things, light and electrons. By light, I literally mean what comes out of flashlights and lasers. And by electrons, I mean the particles whose motion we call electricity. And that's it. This is literally everything I study. But it's amazing how many questions you can answer just in terms of these two objects. Here's a basic example. Have you ever wondered why light passes through some materials but seems to bounce off and reflect off of others? Something like glass versus something like a metal? I'll give you a, a quick picture of how that works. All materials are made of trillions of trillions of atoms. What light can do is it can free an electron from a material, leaving behind an empty space that we call a hole. The electron is now free to move around, but actually, so is the hole. What do, I, what do I mean by that? How does a hole move? Well, if a nearby electron jumps into this hole, it leaves behind a new hole. And if that keeps happening over and over again, essentially you just have a hole moving left to right because electrons are moving from right to left. So physicists treat it that way. We treat the hole as if it's an, the opposite of the electron, and it moves around as if it's its own, own entity. And then finally, when the electron and hole meet up again, the electron jumps back into the hole and gives back the light that freed it in the first place. Now, we could summarize this whole story in a little doodle. Light comes in, creates an electron and a hole, and an electron and a hole can come back together again to make light. This is how uh, materials reflect light. And the best part is, this is more than just a doodle. It's math in disguise. Every part of this diagram has a specific mathematical meaning that a physicist can use to actually calculate the reflectivity of a material. And so the que questions like, what is the reflectivity of a material, boil down to a little game where you try to figure out all the different ways that two wiggly lines can attach to one loop. I play the same exact game in my research for more complicated interactions between light and, and materials. I start by writing down all the diagrams that satisfy a certain set of conditions, and the math just comes out from there. It's, it's, uh, it makes, it's not, it not only makes calculations easier, but also makes extremely clear what is happening with the light and the electrons underneath all the math. To give another example of how I use this in my research, what I'm playing with on the left here is called a superconductor. You know you have a superconductor if you take an ordinary magnet and it appears to, sorry about that, it appears to levitate, whatever, it appears, it appears to levitate above the, the material. Uh, it's really one of the coolest things. And unfortunately, I mean that literally because Every material we know that can do this, we have to get down to very, very cold temperatures. Over here, I had to use liquid nitrogen. So how does a superconductor work? Well, correlation is key. Don't you hate when you're stuck in traffic in a line of unicyclists? <laughs> and it's so annoying, right? Because even when the first person gets moving, you have to wait for the next person to react, and then the next person to react, and it's just this really slow and frustrating process. So I mean, the, the last time my friends and I were in this situation, 
um, I suggested, well, you know, why don't we just share tandem bicycles instead? And that helped a little bit, made things about twice as fast, but we still had this problem where each bike had to wait for the bike in front of them to move, and it's still just this inefficient process. What really did the trick is when we all chained our tandem bicycles together, and that way the, when the first person can move, we all move together as one giant super bike. <laughs> electrons face this problem every single day. At high temperatures in a metal, electrons are uncorrelated, all doing their own thing, all getting in each other's way. But in some metals, when you cool them down, the electrons partner up into pairs. And what pairs of electrons can do that individual electrons cannot is condense into one giant superfluid that can flow without resistance. Do you know that about 10% of our electrical energy is wasted in power lines just getting it from place to place? It's because our electrons are getting stuck in traffic. Imagine if we can get a superconductor to work at room temperature and the environmental impacts that might have. So a lot of my research goes into not only understanding superconductors, but understanding how we can make new kinds of superconductivity. And again, we can understand this in terms of a doodle. Since it's all about electron pairs, we can write down a doodle that represents an electron pair forming and breaking. And we can immediately write down two diagrams that represent how light can interact with the superconductor. A recent result that I'm very excited about is that we could potentially engineer new types of superconductivity using light. Light can assist in the breaking and forming of electron pairs and can even form types of electron pairs that we've not yet found in nature, corresponding to new types of superconductivity with new kinds of applications. And again, they're more than just doodles, they are math in disguise. This is a quantitative formula that could help you determine for a particular material how well can the, the superconductivity super switch between two different kinds. So that was a whirlwind, but if I want to leave you with one message, it's that I, I, I want to show you not only all the really cool physics that materials that are going on in materials, but also that it's all a lot more approachable than you might have realized. It's a shame that physicists' chalkboards tend to do more to intimidate than to inspire. But the reason these doodles mean so much to me is that they're a constant reminder that there is always a simple picture behind all the math. And some of the most important ideas in physics are accessible to anyone who can doodle. Thanks.